This is Will Stewart from OnlineChessLessons.net, and right now I'm going to be looking at one of the best games ever. This was played by Garry Kasparov in 1999 with the white pieces against Bulgaria's Vasilin Topalov, and this was played at Vikanzi. And so this was when Kasparov, uh, he was the world champion, he was crushing everybody, he was like 100 points higher than everyone, and uh, he was just very dominant as a world champion. You know, he won almost every single event that he played. He, he very rarely lost. I, I think he almost never lost two games in a row. And uh, so, yeah, we'll go ahead and kick things off here. So Kasparov with white, and Topolov's playing black here. Uh, he opens with the perk defense uh, with his d6 and knight f6 here. And Kasparov plays bishop e3. This is just a, a very common way for white uh, to develop here against the perk instantly with the queen d2 so it looks like he wants to play bishop to h6 sometime soon and uh, black plays c6 here so it looks like he probably wants to play some kind of early b5 and usually accompanied by a later e5 by black Kasparov plays f3 he wants to avoid knight to g4 so I'm trying to preserve his his dark squared bishop and black plays b5 to gain space on the queen side, and now white's got to worry about this b4 push sometime. So white uh, continues finishing his development in the center. It moves like g4 are possible, but it just doesn't seem very realistic or necessary to play this type of committal move so early. Uh, it's better, you know, I like Kasparov's idea. He just finishes development, you know, very compact center here, and then he's going to be ready to lash out on the king side if he needs to. And here, Topala played knight bd7. This is cool, but I think I would have preferred h5. Um, the plus of h5 is that it stops the idea of bishop to h6. So now, you know, right now white is ready to play that, and, and he's definitely ready. I mean, his center is very compact and well defended. And uh, the idea with h5 also is that it will stop white from playing g4. But the big downside is that, first of all, white is always going to have a home for a piece on g5. So you can just camp a bishop out here uh, if he wants to. And also, if black ever wants to put his king here, uh, this, is gonna, this, this, this pushing the pawn to h5 is going to weaken the g6 pawn. So maybe it'll make f4 and f5 or, or some kind of break on the king side that much more effective. Uh, in the game, Topalov, he just develops. And Kasparov took advantage of this and played bishop to h6. And so uh, if castles here, it's really sketchy. White is going to get a really nice attack, probably just directly with h4, maybe knight g3 and h5. That looks like a pretty, pretty easy way to push, uh, to push forward, or maybe g4 and h5 as well. So black doesn't really want to do that. He captures here to uh, kind of push white's queen out of the way, and now black is definitely not going to castle kingside. So he finishes developing and gets ready to go queenside. Kasparov plays a3. It's kind of a funny move. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting move, this a3 idea. It's almost like he's waiting to see what black is going to do. And he just wants to make sure that his knight is going to be able to hang out here and not worry about moving it. I guess, uh, you know, if, if b4 immediately, maybe he was worried about having to play knight a4. And this doesn't look very good for white because black's going to have long-term pressure on the A-file. So maybe Kasparov didn't want to have to retreat the knight and you know kind of lose, uh, lose some time going backwards. So that's why we saw this A3 move here. Topalov, he plays E5. He tries to strike in the center, open things up. This is definitely logical. His main problem is, is kind of a... I mean, I guess here, you, you know, he could also play queen c7. He could also even play knight to b6, just trying to jam a knight in somehow. Maybe followed by a5 and b4. Still very early in the game. Uh, e5 is, you know, there's simply just different plans, and, and e5 is one of them. I mean, the thing is, you know, the plan in the game, you know, Kasparov castles, and Topolis plays queen e7. Um, this, this is one plan. But what I don't really like about it, it seems like he wants to play e5 to open room for the queen to play queen e7. And it feels like this is a reaction to white's queen on h6, and that black is nervous about the queen coming in and, and kind of harassing black's king side. But I, I don't really feel like this is a genuine threat. And I think that 
After a3, black should probably just play queen to c7. I am imagining white would castle anyway. And it, it seems like black can castle queenside with no problem. Uh, if queen to g7, simply rook df8. Uh, and uh, black's threatening h5. You know, if the queen goes back, I mean, it, it seems like black's position is very solid. And, and he doesn't need to be so concerned uh, about white's queen on h6. I, I would think more than anything, white's queen is out of the game. So e5, uh, but this, you know, it's tough to criticize this play. I, mean, I, I think it's fine. Just maybe, maybe not the most accurate. Now a6, so it looks like uh, black wants to kind of break in the center sometime with c5, and he plays this move to defend the b5 pawn. And what this also says, you know, king b1 is a nice move by Caspro. It's, it's a very nice waiting move. Um, just to go back, I mean, he's trying to figure out where does he put the knight. Is he going to play g4? h4 doesn't really seem necessary i don't know why he'd attack on the king side uh, he should probably just focus on the center as we know black's king isn't going to go king side he's definitely going over the queen side um, so i think the king b1 um twofold first of all it's effective to get the king out of the center it's preparing to open the position second of all as we're going to see you know it, it opens up a nice square and a rerouting um, path for the knight i mean if a5 by black this is a move um, maybe it, it's, it will get very interesting now. After a5, I mean, I, I kind of like this for black, but it's tough to say because what is he going to do with his king? And if he can't get this other rook over, you know, it seems like it, it would be very difficult. Uh, this, this a5 move could be kind of loose. It seems like it might be kind of tough for black to actually cement the attack. So he plays a6, trying to play more in the center. Uh, it, now c5 is possible that b5 is protected. And he reroutes the knight. This also opens the bishop up. Black finally castles. And knight to b3. And, and I think it's, it's pretty instructive to show just in the last few moves. After a6, the instant a6 is played, Kasparov reroutes his knight. From b3, it's going to be able to hit this weak square on a5. And that's going to be very bothersome for black. We'll see later. So he just really found like the weakest square in, in black's position and just instantly goes to plant the knight. Now after captures, the natural move would be knight takes. But I, I like this rook takes because it seems like he really just wants to jam the knight in. A5 is such a loose square. And the reason is black's queen went to e7. If it had gone to c7, it would have been eyeing the queen side and protecting black's king there. So I think that's one of the benefits of having black's queen on c7 instead of where it is on e7. C5, opens the bishop, pushes white back. Uh, knight to B6, this is a very logical move. Just uh, playing in the center, and it looks like black really wants to just play D5, and, and he'll probably have a good position. Also possible, um, just because I'm familiar with the game, I might suggest king to B8 as a useful prophylactic move. You know, now white doesn't really know if the knight's going to B6 or E5. So I, I think this king B8 idea is, is actually pretty cool. Um, knight to b6, and now we see g3. And this g3 was a pretty interesting idea here. Um, it's it's kind of like you know it's it's kind of like what is white up to? Uh, he, you know it's it's obvious the bishop doesn't have much of a future over here. He's probably not going to end up sacrificing it on b5. It doesn't really seem to do anything. So okay, the bishop on this diagonal doesn't have a future. So it's kind of like Kasparov first. He transfers the knight to the queen side. And now with g3, he's getting ready to put his bishop on a nice square as well. It's going to be jamming right at black's king. So black moves his king. White plays knight a5. Uh, black definitely doesn't want to give up that bishop. You know, it's a very good bishop uh, supporting black's king and, and also in the center. So he takes it back. And now bishop h3 anyway. And I, I think uh, this, is, this is where things get really interesting. I mean, now... Bishop's on a nice diagonal, but black is able to play d5. Kasparov throws his check. Very interesting check. Kind of works well with this bishop to push black's, black's king towards the very corner. The reason queen f4 works, first of all, queen c7, we just take the knight. It's a free piece. If queen d6 or rook d6, white's just going to play e5. And he's going to be forking these guys and winning another piece. 
So basically, black has to play king a7. And now things are getting a little bit crowded, white's knight, everything. But it looks like black is doing very well. He's got the pawn on d5. If white's going to capture this, pretty much every single one of black's pieces is going to blast into the game. And black's going to have an awesome position. Nice weakness on e3. And, uh, you know, the rooks uh, are, are going to come to the center. Black really is going to be doing incredible. It's going to control the game. Maybe you can try c4, queen c7, or something to, to trap white's knight. But, you know, Kasparov has some tricks here. He plays rook he one And this is where things start getting a little bit, a little bit irrational. It start getting very interesting. So, first of all, with this rook move, um, we can say that black can take this. And I, I think here, you know, white... Is maybe th th maybe this was the best continuation for Black, uh, judging on what happened. I think in this position, it's it's gonna be kind of tough for White to prove like a big advantage. Maybe he can capture Rook takes and pawn takes. Maybe this is what he had in mind, where you know he's got a dynamic position, uh, but I guess Black doesn't have too much to play here. I mean, I I, I, I think I prefer White, but it's definitely unclear. Maybe knight h5 or something, or knight d7 to e5. It, it doesn't seem so crystal clear to me uh, after d takes e4. In the game, Topalov went for more. He played, e, he played d4. And so Kasparov plays knight d5. He doesn't go backwards, right? He's just developing every single move. After an exchange here, uh, I think taking with this, with this knight, the problem is now... Uh, it. It's it's difficult for Black to move his queen and still defend the f7 pawn. And uh, okay, I mean I I think that's that's good enough, right? He moves a queen, he's just going to run into this. So basically, knight d5 seems to force knight b takes. Why it's forced? Uh, I mean, you could take with the bishop, but knight c6 come in. You know, the rook opens up. This knight d5 really just unleashes a lot of the energy in White's position. So after captures, now the rook is hitting the queen. So queen d6. And it really seems like black is building a winning position here. It, uh, by, by all appearance, I mean, if you just looked at it, you'd think, well, white is going to lose the d5 pawn. His knight's completely out of the game on a5. The bishop on h3 is probably not even doing anything. And uh, the only thing really good white has, go has going for him is, is he's got a good rook on the e5. He's, he's, you know, everything else, he's going to lose the pawn. Black's got more space, everything. But here, Kasparov plays one of the craziest moves I think I've ever seen. He plays rook takes d4. This was nuts. With the, the first couple of times I looked at the game, I, I just really didn't get it. Uh, it. It took me a minute. You know, it's, it's really crazy. So basically, the idea is that if, if Black takes it, he's going to play check. Or not even check. He, he's going to play... Um, rook to e7 first. And so now, this, this is where the combination almost even starts. Is after sacking two rooks, if, if black accepts the second rook, now there's check on d4. Right? So he's got to move the king somewhere. He can't block it. Which means he's got to go to b8. Now queen to b6 check. This, this is completely six. So queen b6. Now the bishop on h3, we see it's, it's cutting off an escape route. If bishop b7, we have check. Followed by mate. And if queen to b7, we have checkmate. Uh, that's, that's just mate on the spot. So that was Kasparov's double rook sacrifice idea for one pawn. Um, in the game here, after queen d6, he did take the rook. He, he did take the first rook. And so we saw um, Kasparov here played rook to e7. And so he throws in the check here, and we just, you know, looked at what happens if queen takes rook. He's, he just, um, black is going to get mated. So he's got to play king b6. If king to b8, uh, it's, it's also looking problematic here, as I believe just a simple queen takes d4. And now just... Basically the same type of threats. If queen takes, we've got check. And how does black stop this threat on a7? 
Um, so, you know, this, this just kind of shows me black is in a lot, a lot of trouble here. So he tries king b6. Kasparov snatches the pawn. So now he's got two pawns for the rook. It's not that bad. If queen c5, looks like he can snatch a, a knight here. Black's king is stuck. If king takes, he's going to lose his queen on the spot. And, uh, you know, rook d6, white's going to snatch another piece. And it, actually, white here would be up a piece in, in the resulting endgame. And probably have a mating attack as well. Uh, black still can't take because of b4. So going back, in this position, Topolov takes, he takes a knight. And now white is only down uh, a rook and a knight. He's got two pawns for the rook and knight. But black's king is stuck on a5. Follows it up with b4. Now queen to c3. And this is pretty crazy. Uh, th this is completely nuts. I mean, white has two pawns for a rook and a knight. But black's king is stuck on the edge of the board. Talk about a mating net. The king is, is really stuck there. And so at first, I was thinking, well, okay, white played queen to c3 to threaten queen b3 mate. Natural move, bishop takes d5, where black's queen is going to continue defending a6. The bishop stops the mate threat. Uh, white's bishop is completely out of the game, completely useless. And, well, that would work, except white has king to b2. And, I mean, this is, this is, this is the craziest game I've ever seen. So he, he's got queen, king b2, and now he's going to sack his queen for mate. And there's nothing black can do about it. The king is completely stuck. Uh, black can do he, he can't do anything I mean let's just say he takes the rook I mean this this could be the resulting position where uh, white is down a queen and two rooks and it's mate in 30 moves so okay that's why after queen takes why does queen takes work because of king b2 now just queen to d4 and uh, black's going to be able to pin <laughs> white's you know one of his only pieces left so after queen takes d5, um, Kasparov first with rook to a7. So he finds another thing to attack here. This pawn on a6. So now we see bishop b7. I think rook d6 definitely worth considering, but the problem would, would, would have to be uh, what are you going to play after king b2? Because of queen d4... Now we can just take the queen, and this is mate on a6. So it, it just absolutely insane. Uh, we can see this rook a7 move. Even though black's up so much material, I mean, what is his extra knight and rook even doing? Not much. And so that's why you see, you know, the rook is needed to defend the queen, basically, on, on d4. So that's why bishop to b7. And so here, you know, not an easy position you know, it's like, how do you get the material back? Um, not, not clear at all. Not at all. So he just plays rook takes b7. We get some of the material back. Uh, now, if black tries to go for like a perpetual check, or, you know, he tries to force the queen trade, I mean, black is definitely up a rook here. The problem is that after queen d1, now king a2, and if another check, it's going to be the same type of checkmate. So here Topalov, I mean, you know, this was 1999. I mean, Topalov was still, uh, even back then, I mean, he was 27, 20 or something. I mean, he was still top 10 in the world. Always such a tactical fighter. So here, after Rook takes b7, we know that black can't take this, right? He would just walk into a mate. Uh, really, just if more than anything, bishop b7 was a deflection, you know, stopping the mate in one. So here black plays queen to c4, <coughs> lining up Rook d1. White doesn't want to trade, so he just snatches a knight. Now we get to a position where white has a bishop and two pawns for black's rook. So he's actually, material, material balance has been, he's, has been restored. But white is also threatening checkmate here on a6. And let's say if check, king here, and check again, uh, white is going to have to trade. But also, you know, not so easy uh, as Black's king is still stuck. I mean, he's just going to take here and play bishop e6 to b3. 
and it looks like black is just going to be losing just the same. Let's say rook here, uh, maybe even rook f6. So we have the same checkmate problems, and if you move the rook, white's just going to sneak the bishop in. So th this type of sample variation, it really shows Kaspar's attack was actually pretty deep. So he, he snatches back the bishop. Now he snatches back the knight. Material balance is restored. And here, Topolov tries to fight his way out by capturing a3. I don't really see what else he can do. I mean, if he moves the check, um, let's say now rook to d8, I mean, you're just walking into mate. So white is still, I mean, you, you can't even forget about that. I mean, white is still threatening a mate in one on a6. And in black defense passively, uh, he's, it's just like he's got to be losing. There's no way you can defend passively in this in this type of position. Maybe just rook b6, uh, a5, uh, you know, who knows? I mean, it, it's this, this is just too crazy. Maybe bishop here. White is, white is getting it all. So in game, queen c4, snatches, and Topalov tries to run with the king. And now we see their queen a6 check. So black's king is on the run still. And now talk about forcing moves. He tries c3 check. The idea is that black can't take with the queen because it's a deflection. And black is going to get mated. So talk about forcing moves after king takes a3. You know, if check, there's really not much. Um, but going here with, with the queen check, um, now, you know, after c3, it's forced to take with the king. And so if queen a3 check, um, black might be able to trade queens. Although it looks like rook c7 check, you know, he'd be losing the queen, but he's under check. Right, so after this, and now queen b2 check, black is in a lot of trouble. So he tries king d1. Now bishop f1 by Kasparov. So he just finishes the game with forcing moves. I mean, this is very instructive. You know, you can use all your time in this kind of position because the only thing that matters is, is going for mate. It's playing the very best move in such a critical spot. And so after bishop f1 here, um, what does black do? I mean, the idea is that if he takes, the first thing I was thinking was, well, queen c1, rook e7, and then, you know, I'm looking at him going, well, black's getting away here. But wait a second, it's not quite so easy. So going backwards, after, if queen takes, he had queen c2 check. And now king e1 gets mated on the spot. So absolutely crazy technique. I mean, Topolov's king has run all over the board and Kasparov is still chasing him down. So bishop f1, the idea, uh, queen e2 would be mate. And so not easy for black. You know, he doesn't even have any checks in this position, right? I mean, that's crazy. So he tries rook d2. So now black is trying to sacrifice into a draw. Or even, he might even be winning with his king so active. I mean, he'd probably be winning. But here Kasparov finds an insane move. You know, it looks like black might be holding it. I mean, if he takes, let's say he takes the rook, um, black is going to be, you know, he's the one doing the checkmating. Absolutely crazy. So after bishop f1, rook d2, the only move Kasparov plays is the winning move, rook d7. Another deflection. So he sacks the rook. Now rook takes. Hey, you know, there's no other move. I mean, he sacked the rook here. If rook to d8, uh, I think he can probably either take the queen or I bet he could just take the rook. Be the same thing. The exact same thing. Um, we could even just say this is mate. I mean, this, this game is nuts. So here after taking on d7, uh, snatching the queen. Now he picks off black's rook. And in this position, it's still a little bit tricky. Even though white has the queen for the rook and pawn, uh, it's still a little tricky because the king and everything is so far advanced. And so after queen to a8, uh, this is a really nice move. You know, now he's, the queen is ready to come back into action. So try c3. Uh, black has got to try to push for the win. You know, he's got to push for the pawn at least. And now queen a4 check, really nice move. Um, you know, it's not that easy. I mean, he's got he's to play forcing moves still. So now cuts off c2, forces the king over. And now f4, followed by king c1. And uh, in this position, black tried rook d2. I mean, honestly, the trick for white, and this is pretty instructive with the rook and pawn versus queen endings, 
the real trick was that he cut off Black from pushing the pawn to c2. And so if Black couldn't push his pawn, if the pawn is frozen, uh, now, you know, White also kind of cut off the coordination with the, between the queen and rook, um, between the king and the rook here. It's, it's just going to be too tough. And so basically White is just, uh, with this f4 move, you know, he's trying to basically push Black into Zug's wing, where Black's going to have to move this rook away. White's going to snatch this pawn. Uh, also, White might come back down and snatch the h7 pawn or something like that. So here, Black tried rook to d2. Uh, he's just trying to play c2, basically, or any kind of forcing moves he can think of. Uh, he can't really play c2. You don't say why he just played this. He can't play c2 because of queen a5, something like this, the pin. But a at least with this rook d2 move, maybe he's going to try to snatch white's pawns. But in the, in the game, white just played queen a7 and black resigned. Uh, why did black resign? Because, well, first of all, he can't take this. Because he's going to lose the rook. And if he moves his king here, say king f1, uh, it looks like white is just going to have a very easy time of going after black's king. Maybe he's just going to play queen e3 and round up the pawn first. That looks easy. Um, or also, um, let's say king f1, I mean, maybe he just even just holds on to his own pawns. You know, rook d3, you just lose the rook. Just to show an example of how tough it is for black. So basically, right right here, uh, black resigned. He just he didn't see a defense to I guess queen c5 or uh, any, any of these moves. I mean, queen takes h7. Any of the, any of these moves really seem to win for white. So just to review, really quick, this game was completely nuts. Start with the the perk defense here. Uh, white he trades off the bishops early. And achieves just a really annoying pressure with the queen on h6. I like that plan. Now castles, king b1, a little bit of prophylaxis. Get the king out of the way a little bit. Uh, now reroutes the knight towards black's weakest square, the hole on a5. After a couple of exchanges here, black is able to open the center. And he starts prepping for d5. Now with g3, it's kind of like the last preparation move for knight a5, bishop h3, and uh, you know all that kind of stuff. But white, white was getting ready to heat things up. And so here after king b8, uh, he pushes him back, puts the bishop on this diagonal anyway, just to cut some squares. Um, now working with the queen and the bishop, you know now it's going to push black's king to the corner. White finishes development finally, whereas Black's rook on h8 is out of the game. It's very important. And after d4, uh, we can see the tactics. You know, White White's ready for the tactical complications from a more solid foundation. That's what sets up this crazy rook sack. And uh, after this, you know, the manhunt is on for Black's king. And a very precise way of maintaining the initiative by White just continued going after Black's King and eventually uh, found just a, essentially a forced combination through forcing moves. It's not like Kasparov saw the entire 20 move combination. He just saw, okay, I can sack this rook or I can sack this piece and I, I can continue making forcing moves. If he can maintain the initiative, the material won't matter. And after rook to d7, um, you know, once. Once uh, Kasparov gets, gets the queen, I mean, he's winning here. So this is Will Stewart from OnlineChessLessons.net, and thanks for tuning in.